I think most people here, I, I know them, they know me, so I don't really need introduction right now. <laughs> and also, true, true. <laughs> I mean, Kenneth, um, I think most of you know him as well. So, is Kenneth, maybe you are the one to introduce yourself. Right? Maybe, or you have done it already. So. Yeah, I, uh, yeah, and sort of introduced me, and I feel okay. a little bit. So, yeah, we're good. But thanks. Um, okay, uh, maybe fund me. Um, I see you, short, you gave us a short version of your name. So, uh, you, would you like to, uh, uh, actually maybe, uh, Haddad, uh, before we do that, Haddad, maybe you didn't quite finish your, um, introduction. Yes, it's okay. Uh, I'm a master's student in theoretical physics at Anaba in Algeria, uh, actually mm -hmm. working on my master thesis about, uh, gauge, gauge gravity duality. Wow. Awesome. You're way ahead of me, young man. <laughs> okay, phone me. Yeah, I'm just to finish for a graduate MSc student at African University of Science and Tech. I'm studying theoretical physics and applied physics. Wonderful. Well, glad you're here. Naranga? Hi, everyone. This is Sizi Naranga from Kenya. Um, How are you? I'm doing well. I'm okay. from Karatina University, and I'm pursuing bachelor's degree in education science, physics, mathematics, option. And uh, I was supposed to finish uh, my studies on April so that we can graduate in September, but uh, due to coronavirus, uh, all, all universities in Kenya have been shut down. So we are waiting right. until next year. We are waiting until next year so that. Uh, I can finish the studies. I think we had the only one month so that we can finish the, the, the exams, but uh, all, is, all has been postponed until next year. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Okay, so it looks like our breakout room will close soon. So I think we can uh, probably go back and uh, join the main group and uh, then we'll see what happens from there. Okay, Ken, when you, when you join the main room, you automatically are muted. So just unmute yourself. Okay, I'm back. That's okay, <laughs> I was working on, share, on my share anyway. Okay, super. So that, that, so that works. So our, um, the first thing we're going to do with a, is sort of a preparatory activity. We call it rolling with Rutherford. It's inspired by, it's not the same as the Rutherford experiment. We are not using alpha particles and we are not using a gold foil. But um, it's inspired by that. In particularly inspired by the fact that Rutherford was able to make, Rutherford and Geiger and Marsden really, were able to make very good measurements um, of something they cannot see or measure directly, which uh, is, will be new for many students. The idea that, you know, well, find the size of that. Well, it's too small for me to measure. That's okay, measure it anyway. And that's sort of what particle physicists do. And um, this is also sort of the prototypical particle physics experiment, because if you look at that, this box here, this is the source of particles and collimates them into a beam. So you have a particle beam, you have a target, the gold foil, and then this phosphor around the edges is uh, our detector. And uh, this is pretty much how particle physicists do their thing. They throw things, at something they want to study and see what bounces how. And the result they get um, uh, gives them an insight into that thing that they cannot see. So um, here's an example, actually, a picture from uh, the, uh, um, uh, one of our workshops in uh, Windhoek, uh, where students are actually doing this uh, uh, physically doing this, um, uh, this experiment. And the idea is you put some number of marbles on a piece of paper with some sides so that 
you can't you have a defined area in which you can uh, hit those marbles and you roll other marbles same size at the original marbles and then you uh, and and then basically see how many bounce and how many do not and you do that to find the probability of a bounce and the probability of a bounce depends on the size of the marble so we use that to actually figure out the diameter of the marble and um, in sort of a in, in our teacher workshop we were able to do this using uh, using uh, sticky notes to make a histogram of the number of hits out of 10 if we gave each person 10 rolls to do then they would say they might get six hits or they might get five or they might get seven and then we simply made a histogram with the sticky notes everybody put their their sticky note on the histogram and we found the most probable number of hits we're not going to do that today we're going to do it a little more electronically because we're all at some distance from each other um so here's actually a uh, a diagram of the uh of the setup that we're going to have so it's 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 going to be a virtual setup in this case that is uh what we have here is uh uh, two barriers 30 centimeters apart so everything has to be within this 30 centimeter width and then we each trial we roll 10 marbles and we have five target marbles and when you're ready to go you click here except of course this is just a picture um, and then it will reset and do it again and basically what we're going to do is each time count how many marbles bounce back some will go through some will bounce back because they're being rolled randomly. Um, and actually, in what, what you'll see, you will not actually see the marbles. You, we will have a cover put over that, just as you see here with what the uh, students in Vinhook did. Okay, so we're going to try it. Now, here's the thing this is what, one of the first places where we need the Indigo page. So we have a simulation to do. We don't have to go to, to breakout rooms to do this. We can all do this ourselves. Um, so each person um, will need to, if you follow what I'm doing, you can do the same thing. You go to the Indigo page. And uh, we want to find rolling simulation. So there's all kinds of links here. Um, and the one we want says rolling simulation. There it is right here. Okay, so if you choose that, you can see it makes a series of uh, rolls, 10 marbles essentially, uh, and uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven of them bounced back. And so your number of, of rolls will be seven. Jeremy Wagner, by the way, is the fellow who wrote this little program. Um, he's a, one, of our, one, of the, one of the teachers in our, in our in ClarkNet. Um, the other thing you need to do this also is uh, a place to record your, uh, your results. And so you go to rolling form over here. So that should be open in your computer as well. It's just a Google form. And I can see it's, whoop, internal error. Oh no. There it goes. Okay. So I saw seven rolls. So I put seven as my answer and click submit. But let's say each of us does this maybe three to five times, depending on your mood, right? So you go back um, to the same place. Notice it's a, on your tab, it'll say glow script. And then you just hit the little arrow and it will, it will run the experiment again. And you can see a bunch of them bouncing, some going through. And when you count it, one, two, three, four bounced back. So we go to our form, submit another response, and we put in four. And then we go again to GlowScript. We run it again. We enter so the can it, you only put in the one that bounced back or the one that goes through? Ah, the ones that bounce back, that's very important, yes. 
So let's run, run one more so we can see. Okay, so if you look at the left side of the barrier, one, two, three, four, five, six, bounce back. And then we just go ahead and we enter that six. Okay, are there any questions as to what we should do? Well, with that in mind, please go ahead. Try the experiment three, four, five times, and then we'll see what results we get. Don't let me stop you. Are there any questions about how to connect? Please don't feel embarrassed to ask. Seems like everyone's good. Yeah, it's starting to happen. <laughs> okay. Let's say we don't want to stop until we have at least, let's see, 17 of us, at least 50 of these, 50 responses. Because as you can see, the histogram does not quite take shape until, uh, until you have some good statistics. Forty responses. We're getting there. Sorry, where's the Google form I meant to fill in? So the Google form, if you go to Indigo, if you go, if you look at all of these links, the second uh, row, all the way to the end where it says rolling form. Okay, thank you. No problem. I'm glad you asked. Oh, we're over 50 now. Keep going. I think we're getting the hang of it. Okay. Maybe we'll stop at 70 instead. It's arbitrary, but there it is. Okay, so based on what we see so far, what do we think the peak of this histogram might be? Would anybody want to hazard a guess as to what the peak of the histogram is? Don't feel shy to unmute yourselves, huh? Right, by all means. I love to hear from you. So think of this as an approximate Gaussian. So at what value of the number of, ro of roles here do we have our maximum? Yes, it's six. Six? Any, 
Any agreement or disagreement? Agreement. Agreement? Okay. <laughs> I agree. Okay. So let's say the peak is at six. So if we go back to our Um, if we go back to our uh, our slides here, how do we get use that information to find the diameter? Well, there are a couple of things that we can think about. Um, first of all, if the peak is six out of ten rolls, then what is the probability of a hit? Six. Six so divided by sixty percent. Ten or sixty percent. Right, but instead of using a percentage, we will use a fraction. So let's make that point six, zero point six. Okay. So yeah. the, prob the probability of a hit is zero point six. There are five target marbles. The width of the beam pipe is thirty centimeters. That's all information we had from before. Um, and we're looking for the diameter of the marble. And here's a hint. This equation is almost right, but it's off by a factor of two. And why might it be off by a factor of two? And uh, it might help, if I stop my screen sharing just for a moment, to think about, here's a marble, Okay, uh, where is, there it is. Oh, oh, no wonder, okay. There's a marble, that's a target. And here's another marble. If it hits, if this one hits directly, of course, it bounces back. But th if it misses, okay, it misses. But somewhere in between, it can still bounce back, right? And even uh, right up to the edge, it can still bounce back. And so that means the distance from center to center on this side is one diameter. And on this side, it's another diameter. So instead of N times D, what do we really put in here? Oh, that should have been a capital D, sorry. Anyway, I'm gonna stop, let you do some calculations and come up with a number. And the worst thing that can happen is you get it wrong, and so what? Because, you know, it's a, it's a simulation. Ken, anyway. could you show that slide again? Oh, sure. Will do. Um, right. So you can see here, this is the almost correct equation. I used the wrong size D, but that's okay. So P equals ND over W. And I'm suggesting that in reality, we should double this D here. So you already know the probability. You know the number of marbles is, is five, but right? probability is 0.6, number of marbles is five. Instead of D, we should have two D and W is 30 centimeters. So can you solve for D in that case? So that's, that's the simple, so I'm asking you to do some arithmetic now. If you want to put your answer in the chat and maybe uh, Shane or uh, Ann can look in on the, uh, uh, can look in on those results and see Tell, tell us what, what's coming. I, sorry, it's a little harder for me to see the chat. From Well, I guess I can do it. Let's see. I can watch, Ken. Thank you.
It was a, a 30 centimeter width, right? Yes. So Haddad gave us an answer. I can see that. And uh, We have another one from Mohammed as well. Uh, okay. At the same time. Okay. Well, it looks like we're coming on a uh, consensus from several people. Maybe a few more people can join in. So several people said it was 1.8 centimeters. Um, I think one and some uh, another person said it's a 0 0.018 meter, which I can't argue with. That's great. Uh, and um, I think only one person suggested, you know, one, a few people suggested 3.6 centimeters. Well, that's that factor of two thing coming in, right? So it's uh, so it's really 3.6 divided by two. So, yep, there's 1.8 centimeters. So, yep. So the, so this is the sort of thing you can do um, in a demonstration with, with people coming to a lecture or you can do it with, with high school students or even we've done it with uh, elementary and, and middle school students, uh, you know, learners. Um, and the, uh, it gets to the point that we didn't have to see the marbles to measure the marbles. And uh, in fact, if someone, if you're using real marbles, which I strongly recommend, um, then what you'll find is that uh, someone might say, well, let's measure the marble with a ruler. And one answer to that is, well, if this were really say measuring the size of an atom, we couldn't do that, right? This is, so, uh, it, for particle physics, this is how you would do the measurement. Um, maybe in three dimensions, a little more complicated, but uh, still, it's how you would do the how you would do the measurement. So, um, uh, so that sort of that sort of gets us particle physics ready. And so, next thing we're going to do is we're going to look at exponential decay. Two reasons: one, because it's fun to do. Um, and the other reason for doing exponential decay is that, um, again, it uses simple materials, but it gets at something that we often teach in schools, people also want to learn about, and that is uh, things like, ha well, for most people, it's half-life. You say the half-life of this isotope is so many years or so many hours or so many seconds, whatever it is. So. Uh, in particle physics, we use something similar to half-life. It's called lifetime. So as you know, the, the half-life of a particle is how long it takes half of the sample to decay or how long it takes half of what remains to decay next. Um, so it's always one over two, one over two to the, you know, one over two to the first, one over two to the second, one over two to the third. That's how, that's how you get half-life. So with lifetime, instead of using uh, uh, two, we use E. So it's, uh, so instead of dividing, so the lifetime of a particle is one over, is how much, how long it takes for one over E of the, of the, uh, of the, um, sample to be, to remain essentially. Okay. So here's how we're going to do this. And it's going to lead right into doing something with muons, which is, which is kind of fun. Um, so we're going to go to our Indigo page. There are two things we need to open. One is called Dice Sim, um, you know, Dice Dash Sim. The other is result, Results Dash Spreadsheet. So I'm going to go there now, and I'm going to start out with Dice Sim. And you have to look for all of these because I don't have. I'm not good at keeping these things in order in Indigo. But there it is. So there's Dice Sim. So the top row, third over. You choose that. Of course, if you have a die with you, that's great. You can use a die. That's fine. Um, 
So what you can do then is change, it says here, roll two virtual dice. We're going to change that to one. And when you say roll dice, you just roll, right? That's fine. And there you get something. So what we're going to ask you to do is roll, is do this roll and roll again and roll again and roll again and keep track until you get to a, to one, to a one on your, on your die. Um, we don't want, uh, we don't want uh, two, three, whatever. We want one. So let me, uh, so let me, let me start again. Okay, so here we're at, we're, we are here now. And so if I, um, okay. So um, basically we roll as one roll, two rolls, three rolls, four rolls, five rolls, six rolls, seven rolls, eight rolls, nine rolls, 10 rolls, 11 rolls. So it took me 11 rolls to get to, uh, to get to a one, okay. Now the next thing we have to open is uh, results, which is, it's the second to last in the second row. And we'll keep this one open because we will use this spreadsheet again. And okay, so we want to make sure we have the dice tab open, not Minerva, not ZMAS, but dice. And these are, uh, um, so these are the uh, number of rolls. So let's say that uh, I am number 20 here. By the way, these here, three and one, that's just dummy uh, numbers just to keep, just to make, to, I use those to make the uh, plot. Uh, so you, so whoever has, is number one, overwrite them. I'm gonna be in 20 and we, I had 11 rolls. So that's what we'll put in there. Okay. Now, um, so what I'd like you to do is if, uh, actually let's do this in, in groups. Um, and if you could break everybody into, uh, into groups of two and then- um, Okay. And then uh, each group does their, their, their group number is their event. So if you're in group one, you put something in here. If you're in group two, you put something in here. Just overwrite these. If you're group three, you put something here. Also add 10 to it. So if you're in group 11, you do another one. So you do two, you, everybody does two rolls. First roll, you put in, for, or rather not two rolls, two experiments. The first experiment, you take count how many rolls you get to get to a one, and then you put that number in. Second experiment, you go to 10 above your group number, do, the set, do it again and put your number in there. Does that, does that make sense? Maybe I'll, uh, I'll sort of type it in chat here just so you know. So step one, Okay. Roll until you get a one. Step two. Put in the Google sheet. Next to your group number. The number of rolls it took to one. 
And then step three, repeat, but use root number plus 10. So Ken, is the group number the row number going uh, down? Yeah, so the group number, I'm sorry, the group number is going to be the breakout session number. So uh, I'll ask Ann to put everybody into a breakout, uh, one of, um, uh, I guess, nine breakout rooms. Is the, will that cover okay. us, Ann? Yeah, yeah, that should. I've, I've got seven for the moment, but I'll, I'll rearrange. So just one thing, everybody copy what... Ken has put in the chat because once you're in the breakout room, you won't see this chat. You'll only see your group chat. Right. So these three little instructions. Yeah. Ken, and Ken, how I long add? do you want oh. the room? Sorry, how, how long do you want the breakout room to be? Maybe three minutes. Okay. Enough. Go ahead, Shane. You want to say something? Uh, yeah, Ken, what do we do in column C, D, E, F, G? Leave them blank. They will, okay. they, will, they will fill out themselves. Got it. And actually, um, Okay, and uh, have if are you arranged at nine rooms? Because we can use ten rooms. We can people can overwrite what I put in. That's fine. Uh, for the moment, we're in seven rooms, but um, okay, I, I, seven I, will, rooms. I will be the eighth room. Okay, seven rooms is fine. That's good. Ken, can I give one more warning? Yes. One thing that we found is let's say that you so you end on a one from one trial, and then if you start the next trial and get a one right away, it sometimes goes unnoticed uh, because it doesn't look like a roll happens. So you have to watch the timestamp. That was one thing we noticed in one of our workshops. I don't know if that okay. makes sense. It kind of makes sense. Because uh, yeah, if, if, if you hit roll and it stays on a one, a lot of times it goes unnoticed that you even roll. Oh, right, right, because you can't see that it Right, right. So you have to watch that timestamp. Yeah. Okay. Fair enough. So I have I have a question for you, uh, Kenneth and, and Shane. What about sure. the, the random number C? Is is it the same for each group of roles? Like all of these breakout rooms, are they, or is is the C the automatically change for? Um, for different I, sequence? I, I haven't written this program myself, the, this randomizer, but it seems like. Uh, uh, I, it, it seems like it, it, it works reasonably randomly. So uh, I think it may be, it may be shifting the seed. I'm not sure. Okay. I mean, the best way to do it is with that, with an actual, actual dice, but that's, uh, you know, I can't assume that you happen to have that with you. Okay. So let's see if the data shows a bias. Huh? Right. <laughs> okay, you ready to go? Let's see. Yes. Okay, I'm going to a room myself. Hi, Fumi. So Funmi, uh, are you pretty clear yeah, yeah. as to what you should do? Yes, yes, I've done some. Okay. So why don't you go ahead, if you want, you can, okay. if you want to share your screen, that's fine. Um, or you can just go ahead and start rolling. That's fine too. I'm connecting on my phone and I'm using my laptop for the integral page. Okay. Would it help if I, um, if I share my screen and then you can tell me what to do? Okay. Yeah. Fine. Okay. So Okay. So let's see. We'll go here and share and we'll go to random. So what's the first, so first thing we do for me? Yeah. Oh, I think we should go back. Okay. 
Okay. Yes. Roll dice. Okay, there's one. Yeah, then roll it. We we'll just keep doing that, right? So there's two. Yes. Yeah. Two. Three. Four. Five. Five. Yeah. Okay. Now we go to the we are we breakout room room one. So we can put a five in here. Yes. Okay. And let's go back and we'll go back again. Go back. Okay. Yes. Roll dice. One. Two. Two. Three. Four. Five. Five. Six. Seven. Okay. Oh, this would be a long one, huh? Eight. Okay. Nine. Nine. Ten. Ten. Eleven. Eleven. Wow. My gosh. Twelve. Thirteen. Thirteen. <laughs> Fourteen. Fourteen. Fifteen. Fifteen. Sixteen. Sixteen. <laughs> Seventeen. Seventeen. 18, 18, 19, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, Nine. Ah! Wow. Oh. <laughs> wow. That goes to wow. the That's the outlier. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Okay. So let's let's leave our, we we've done something, so let's leave our breakout room now and uh, we'll go and we'll, we'll talk okay. with everybody. I can see people are putting their numbers in. That's good news. Yes. Not everybody yet, but a good number. Okay. I think everyone's back, Ken. Ken, you're muted. Thank you. Yeah, Funmi and I uh, were working together. We had 29 roles we had to do for number 11. Um, so I think we are the outlier. Um, so uh, we did have, in, in our case, we did go to 33. Is oh, that correct? Wow. A serious outlier. But then okay. we restarted it. <laughs> I, <laughs> I didn't put a number in, we restarted it. Yeah. Well, actually, uh, it doesn't really record beyond 10. So, <laughs> so how the way this works, by the way, is there's a, uh, what this does is looks and it sees if uh, you know, if, if the number of rolls is greater than zero, okay, great, puts in a one. If not, it leaves it blank. And then the next one, if the number of rolls is greater than one, if the number of rolls is greater than two. So we fill all these up, and then we sum them up. I'm sorry, we sum up down here rather the num the number of times it was uh, zero rolls, which really just means that. Uh, uh, that we had, you know, uh, that's how many rolls actually occurred. And then, um, or how many dice we had. And then, then after one roll, we still had 12. After two rolls, we still had 10. After three rolls, we still had seven, et cetera, all the way down the line. So, um, all the way down to 10. And then it made a, plot like this. So again, you could do this with students by having them roll. And then what I would do normally if it's, if I were in a classroom is I would say, okay, how many did not have a one? Can, can, can you share your screen? Um, oh, I'm, am I not sharing my screen? Sorry. Yeah, I forgot to, I forgot to tell you that I need reminders about that. <laughs> 
Uh, yeah. So yeah, just let me go back again to show you again. So what this does is, so the reason we want to fill this out is because this counts essentially how many, this works out how, how many uh, individual rolls you had to make. And then it counts the number, sums them up here. So after zero rolls, 14, after one roll, 12, after two rolls, 10, et cetera. And then it makes a plot over here. So this is essentially an exponential decay. Um, and uh, so you can see then that, that the, uh, um, that, that there is decay in the number of dice. If you start with 14 dice, you end up with a decay in the number of dice and it slowly goes down to a small number. And uh, there are even outliers way out at 29 and 33. So um, to find the half-life then of our dice, what we do is we say, well, if this is 14, half of that is seven. Then we go out here, oh, that looks like three rolls, about three rolls is our half-life. And we go down to three and a half, about there. That looks like about between five and six. So that's pretty consistent. So, um, so it looks like we have a half-life of maybe three, 3.5, something like that. So just by observation, you can tell what the half-life is of our simulated particle. And if we want to get uh, the lifetime, we would say, let's see, this is, uh, well, that used 20, so let's go to 14. Uh, so we should go down to 5.15 rolls. So it looks like the lifetime is between four and five. So, um, and we'll just leave that one blank. So, um, so this is, so putting your teacher or your presenter hat on for a moment, um, I think this is something that can be done physically with students or if you have a large group, you can do it like this using, uh, um, using electronic methods or if you're of course doing it remotely like we are. Um, Let's see, so, any comments so far? I have a question about uh, the number of dice we use here. Mm -hmm. did, did the situation change if we take more than one dice? Um, yes, it would. It, um, so, if, for example, you take two die, then, um, then uh, you, depending on how you want to do your simulation, you could say you roll until both are one, or you could say you roll until one of them gives you a one, then you remove that, and then you continue rolling for the second one. So then you get two results like that. Another way to do this, by the way, is you give every student 50 dice, and they shake, then they pull out the ones. They shake again, they pull out the ones. And so they can get a very, uh, they have to record all their results, but then they can see how many they had after each number of uh, rolls, and um, and they can actually do the do the make the plot themselves. But that's a lot of dice to hand out to a large number of learners. So uh, in that case, we I would suggest just give each one of them one to work with. Does that help? I haven't really get the idea how we pass from the dice results to to the muon decay, uh, for example. I'm glad you asked, because that's what we're going to do. So this is a preparation. Oh, were we using? Oh, no wonder. This says muon decay and Minerva, so this is sort of a simulation of that, right? But here we're going to do muon decay and Minerva again, and these these there's some dummy data in here again. But now what we're going to do is go to our slides and talk a little about a little more about it. So now we're going to muons. So 
a little background helps. So the Minerva experiment uh, recently closed down, actually, but it, it's a neutrino experiment designed to measure at Fermilab in uh, in Illinois, about three hour drive from where I am, um, and uh, they uh, actually measure th their purpose is to is to look at interactions of muon neutrinos with nuclei to understand that interaction. Um, so normally what happens is that, so they make a, neut a neutrino beam uh, from the Fermilab accelerator. They, it's called the NUMI beam, new, uh, neutrinos from the main injector. So it's really a proton beam that hits a target, makes pions. The pions decay into muons. The muons decay into muon neutrinos. And those muon neutrinos come into the detector and they hit something in the detector, and the result is the muon neutrino reverts to a muon, and the, the neutron that it hit inside a nucleus became a proton. So it's a weak interaction. Okay, so that's not what we're going to study today, per se. Um, that's a really interesting uh, interaction, and we, we do have a way of looking at that as well, but we want we're focusing on muons right now. The key is this interaction doesn't have to happen in the detector because the neutrino beam comes through, essentially it, it travels underground and it goes through solid rock. And so instead of hitting a target, in a, a, a nucleus in the, de in the detector, it can easily hit a nucleus in the rock. And then what happens is a proton is ejected and a, and, and a muon is ejected. The muon travels into to the detector. The proton doesn't get very far, and so it's absorbed in the rock. But that muon goes into the detector, and sometimes it has just the right energy that it runs out of energy in the detector and stops. And that, then we start our stopwatch, our metaphorical stopwatch. So we have essentially a muon that came through here, stopped, we start timing it, and then when it decays, it decays into an electron and two neutrinos. And that electron, it's called a Michelle electron, that electron gives a little uh, indication in the detector. So first we see the muon trap that stops, then later we see the indication of the electron, and we measure the distance between those two to get the decay time for that particular muon. And so, but if we do that a lot, then we can get, then we can, then we can start to generate numbers for the decay of muons. And just to remind you, a muon, there's a muon in the standard model chart. It's like a heavy electron. It's one of the uh, leptons. Um, they tend to, they, they tend to be very penetrating particles, which is why we use them in so many different ways in particle physics. So this is pretty much saying what we just said. Um, and let, so I'm gonna show, try to work, walk through with you what we're gonna do. And you don't actually have to open this yourself, I'll open it. Uh, there is a, is Muon Lifetime example group, that's the one I want. And I'm going to open that. I have two examples. So what we did was we took an event in Minerva is actually really could better be referred to as a gate. That is, over some time, various things happen in the, in the detector, and we record them uh, when they happen. And so for each gate or each event, we recorded four things that happened. So, so that means it takes two pages in my little, uh, my, in these slides here. So in, so in example group event one, these four things happen. So this is a side view of the detector. And um, so this is where muons will come in from for, our, for what we're trying to study. And then we look at what happens. And so there are four things that happened in the detector. One of these is the muon coming in, and one of them is the uh, is the 
electron that resulted. The muon coming in pretty much has to start somewhere to the left. And most importantly, it has to stop before it gets close to the end. So anything that comes around here really is basically a muon that's going out of the detector again. A muon going out of the detector doesn't help us. So it has to stop inside the detector. So that means this image is significant because here we have a muon that stopped inside the detector. That's good. Now we have a couple of small marks over here, but if you notice, they're not at the same place as where the muon stopped. So they kind of don't qualify. There could be something else going on inside the detector. Uh, here we have another muon coming in and it goes all the way to the end. So that's, that's uh, not a useful muon for us. But here now we have something that was made. And if you look, it's pretty much where the uh, muon stopped. You can even look and see uh, the module numbers. You know, it's, it stopped like between module 70 and 72. And this looks like, uh, well, it's a little, starts a little, little, a little further back, but the, the electron could have easily, since the muon is at rest, the electron could have been produced and gone backwards. So it's in the right place, essentially. So that means this and this are the two parts of the event we're interested in. And for each one of these, we can see there's a mean time. And uh, the mean time here is hard to read, but it's there, 4246 nanoseconds. And then if I go to where the, we have the electron, that's 10,092 uh, nanoseconds. And let me see if I have, no, I don't, okay. So then what we can do is essentially take that and say, okay, 10,092 minus, whoops, there it is, 4246 is some number. So you have to do a little, a little bit of arithmetic. Do that subtraction between the time for the electron and the time for the incoming muon, and that becomes your decay time. And then you go back to the, uh, the results page in Minerva, go to your group number again. And what you're going to do then is put that decay time in column C next to your group number under delta T. Um, and then this will do the rest of the counting for us. So um, just so you can see, there's another another example um here's another muon so this is here we are this is event am i looking at the right one oh uh, that's supposed to say example group not group a but okay that's my mistake anyway this is event two and we can see here there's a muon. Muons are always long green tracks. They're long because they don't interact much. They're green because the software color coded them that way. But this one goes all the way to the end. So that's not good. This one stops right at about module 53 or so. That's interesting. And here we have some energy indication right about the same place. And this and this uh, this one also it goes out of the detector in a different way, but there it is. So we really want this one and this one, and so we would take the mean time uh, twenty five fifty one, and the mean time fifty five twenty two. So fifty five twenty two minus uh, twenty five fifty one will give us our delta t, and then we go back here and if I were in group one, for example, I would go to, for, I would put the first number I got in one, I'd put the second number I got in 11. If you want to do a third, by the way, there's a group B, but for now we'll stick with group A. Okay, so what you're going to do is instead of opening the second to last 
on the top, which is what I did, you're going to open the, la the, the very last uh, in the top row, and that's group A. That's what everybody's working with. Um, and there's group B if somebody wants to use it. But right now, we'll stay with group A. So, um, okay, let's go back to our slides. So here are the rules. We'll go to breakout rooms again, same breakout rooms, and we'll be fine. Um, then we go to the data from the Indigo page. We find, uh, our, we find our events. So, uh, so basically what that means is go to Minerva Group A, um, and then you ha you'll have to scroll down to find your event. So if you're in group, if you are in breakout room four, you scroll down to event four. And then you will decide which of the two images you want to use and subtract the, the mean times. And then you'll enter that into group four in the spreadsheet. So each event has four sequential parts, as you saw, and the right find the, the right muon track and the decay signal, subtract the times, and put that into the results spreadsheet in Indico. Okay, so uh, this will, so, so you may want to keep this open sort of as your general rules. Um, before we start, are there any questions about what to do? Because I want to make sure we get this right. So it's just, again, if we were doing this, we would do this somewhat differently if we were in a classroom. Um, and, but uh, this, uh, this works pretty well for um, working with, uh, uh, working re remotely. At least I think it should. So are there any questions about what to do? So Ken, just make sure I have it right. Each room is going to do one event, correct? Within group A? Actually, they'll do, ah, they'll do two events. So they will do, if, if you are in, if you are in um, breakout room five, you will do event five and you will do event 15. Okay. So like last time. Thanks. Yeah. And then if you're bored, you can open up data group mm -hmm. B and do another one. Okay. Okay. So they, um, they start with group A, and then if they fast, they do group B. Is that correct? Yes. Well, they do, they, right now, I think just start with group A, and they do two in group A. Their, their breakout room number, and then 10 plus their breakout room number. And then if they, then they can go to group, then if they have a lot of time, they can go to, they can go to group B, and they use their breakout room number again. But they don't have to. You can do just do two. You can just do two, and that's fine. Other questions? Okay, so, and let's give this about. What do you think? Six minutes. Okay. Okay, that's chance for questions. A uh, question from Michael. Let's just read it and then. Okay. I have a problem inputting the value in the result spreadsheet. Michael, you mean editing? Michael says, I have a problem inputting the value in the result spreadsheet. Okay, let me take let's a quick look double. here. Make sure that is yeah. properly set up. Every once in a while, I make a mistake. It should say anyone with on the internet with this link can edit. So you should be able to put it in. Um, I think I was paired with Michael on the second group I went to and he was, it was on his phone that he was having, if I, if I yeah, understand I it correctly. You, so I, yeah, I think, I th it, I th go ahead. I'm sorry. No, I think, I think I was just his, uh, the device that he's on made it difficult to enter in the spreadsheet. Right. Yeah. I, I, I think it's harder to do on a phone. I, I, I'm almost certain of that. So I could join uh, and I could go into his group again and enter the data for mm -hmm. him because he had the results last time and I just entered the data. Okay, sounds good. 
All right, let's go. Okay. Kunmi, you're back. Great. Okay, um, Kunmi, you can unmute if you don't mind. Yeah. yeah. Ah, there we are. Okay. So, um, shall we do the same? I'm on this sheet. Sorry? I thought I'm on this sheet right now. The okay, first good. Group A events, zero one. Right. So there's a 500 there, but we will just overwrite that. That's uh, that's dummy data. Yes. So, um, okay. And uh, first we have to go to the uh, actual data set. So that's the example data group. We don't need that anymore. What we need is... Yeah, I'm not sharing your screen. There it is. This is... Well, that's also the example data group. This is group A. Okay. Okay. Okay, so we do event one. So there's two pages of that. So. Share your screen, please. So um, the first thing we look for is the muon. So where do you think the muon comes in? The one we want. Can you please share your screen? Oh, am I not sharing? I'm sorry. I need to be reminded of that constantly. <laughs> okay, you see it now? Yes, yes. Okay, good. Okay, so these are our four events. This one, this one, this one, and this one. So which one do you think has the useful muon? The second one. Agreed. And that has a mean time of 41.38. Yes. And so it should be one of these two because they're sequential. So it's, it comes, so it's either this or this. So, which do you think it might be? Or more to the point, what question do you have about it? Whoops. Hi, Anne. I think I lost Funmi. Oh, you're, by the way, and you're muted. Oh. Yeah, hi. I see what happened. I, uh, somehow I ended up leaving the breakout room in, in, by accident. Oh. My fault, okay. So let me share my screen again. Okay. So do you see that? Yes, the second okay. one. So... The second one is our muon. So which would be our Michelle electron, do you think? The last. So the last one has something else going on. Something hit and made a tremendous shower. So this is- Okay, the, 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 next, the third one. Yeah, I think so too. So this is pretty much not from a shower. This is from and it lines up pretty nicely with, with, with the, uh, where the muon stopped. So that's 49.59. The answer is 8 to 1. The difference. 8, eight, eight to 1? Yes. Okay, so we put that in here. 8 to 1. Boom. Right. So then we go to event 
11. Same. And 11, Sorry? okay. Right, so. Event 11, event one, yeah. Then we do event 11. So we add 10 to our group okay. number. Okay. Um, so to be the first. There we are. There's group, there's 11. Oh yeah, look at that. Ah, right, so you see it too. Good. You got it on your on your uh, computer? Yes. Okay. Yes, yes. Okay, great. Or your phone, I guess. You can see it. That's the main thing. Yes, okay. I can. I'm okay. using my phone and my computer. Oh, you you you're doing everything. Wow. Excellent. Yes. Okay. And <laughs> um okay then. And then uh which do you think where do you think the Michelle Electron comes in? The Okay, the the muon is coming from the first, then we have the electron mm -hmm. on the third. Yeah, the third. 60, then this is around the 60. The first, then the third. First and third. So what's our delta T? Yeah, Six, eight, five, seven, nine, eight, four, 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 zero, eight, five. Four, zero, eight, five. Okay, so we'll put that in. Number 11. Okay. So. Yeah, try speak. Malugeta. Ah, okay. We have some of our results in. A few groups didn't get it all done. Uh, does anybody want to fill in a few more or if you, if you're still working on it, we can give you a, another minute or two. Okay, so of course this is not as easy as rolling as rolling dice. Um, it requires you to make some uh, some choices, and uh, and you have to uh, then see what numbers you get. And so some of us some of us were able to do that in in the, in the allotted time, and some oh there are a few more coming in. I have to change these again. So we're getting there though. That's good. Okay, so if we, this is sort of a much rougher exponential decay curve than we had before, um, because we don't have, don't have quite as much data. But uh, if you were to do this with a class of say 30 or 40 learners, and uh, each one had say, uh, you know, uh, 
each two of them perhaps had two or three to do, then we have a little bit bigger statistics. Um, and, or we could also give them more time and they could have a lot more to do. There's actually a place on the web called neutrinoclassroom.org where you can, um, you can, you can actually uh, run, uh, get a lot more data than we have here. And so uh, in any case, if we look at our result again, uh, we started at 11, so the half-life would be about 5.5. Uh, 5. Uh, that would have to be gone, and that looks like it's at about somewhere between two and three thousand, uh, maybe a little more, a little more, uh, but somewhere around here um, for the uh, uh, the, uh, the half-life. That is to say, the half-life should be somewhere between two and three thousand nanoseconds. Um, if we divide by E to get the lifetime, we get right about four. And again, that looks like it's coming all the way out here. So this is a pretty far off, <laughs> to tell you the truth. Um, so the normal, normally the lifetime we would get is about 2.2 .2 microseconds or 2,200 nanoseconds. In this case, I think we didn't quite get to the, the statistics we need to get that uh, level of detail. So, okay, that's life. That's the way it works sometimes. Um, but uh, if, again, if you were to do this with a, lar a larger group of learners and you could say do groups A and group B, you could have something like 30 events, I think you would start to get a pretty good result. Okay. Um, any questions or comments before we move to the next thing? Uh, Ken, sorry, I didn't catch, where would one find uh, more data? Um, I'll put, so I'll put it in the, in the chat. Um, it's called, actually you can go to our um, data portfolio. And uh, that will have a, uh, that will have a link to it as well. Um, but basically, the difference is in neutrinoclassroom.org, and I can actually show, show you what it looks like. Um, there is the, so these are, <clears throat> there are <clears throat> 20 data sets, each has 20 events. And the way the data sets work is you start with an event and then you have to scroll through to find your muon. Maybe that's oh, our cool. muon. Hmm. Maybe that's our muon. That's not our muon. And then maybe that's our muon. And you scroll through until you find also the Michelle electron. That could be it. So then basically, I'm not going to go through the whole thing. But you have to yeah, match yeah. the Michelle electron with the muon and do it that way. I made it <clears throat> so it should go faster by, by limiting you to only four slices of the event. Okay. Does that help? Yeah, yeah, sure. Okay. Okay. So the last thing we're going to try is, uh, I, is the invariant mass of the Z boson. And this hopefully will go faster than you think. So <clears throat> the basic idea is, of course, to remind you the Z boson is uh, one of the exchange bosons. It's, a, it's one of the two weak bosons. And it's a neutral particle, which means when it decays, it can go to a positive and a, neg and a, and a negative uh, lepton, in this case, a positive muon and a negative muon. Um, or muon and anti-muon, but we just think of them as two muons. And um, Z bosons decay very rapidly, so very promptly. So we, we never actually measure the Z boson itself. We don't see it. It's just not there. Um, rather, we see the decay products, in this case, the two muons. Um, and we can measure the momentum 
and the energy of the muons, and then work backwards to figure out the mass of the Z boson. Um, now, we're going to use data from CMS. We have perfectly good data from Atlas. Um, but uh, the advantage of CMS is that we need to measure angles. And you can measure angles in the CMS events because there are radial lines which are nine degrees apart. And so you can estimate the angles. So um, let's go ahead and take a look at how it works. We've got uh, what am I looking for here? Hmm, Z calc. I think there may be something I did not include. Hang on. I have to check something. Yep. Ah. Okay. I had a feeling there'd be one thing I would miss. Sure enough, I did. Okay. This will take me about a minute. Okay. So we need our Z boson events, and they I had forgotten to upload them. But now they are in the last, the, the the second from last in the last row. And so if we open that up, we can see here they are. And um, so here's an event in. Atlas, and basically what we do is, you can see there are two muons, those are the long red tracks, and one is 21 degrees from the x-axis, the other is 47 degrees from the minus x-axis, which means it's 227 degrees from the x-axis. You're given a momentum of 49.5 GeV over C, and another one of 42.3 GeV over C. One of the great joys of particle physics is that the energy of each muon is the same number in GeV as the momentum because the muons have so little mass and so much energy that, uh, that, the, that the mass portion of its, of, of its energy is not uh, significant. So, uh, we can use these numbers for both the energy and the momentum. And so what we do is we add up the momenta in components and then find the net momentum and we add up the energies just as pure numbers. And then we use this equation, E squared equals P squared plus M squared to figure out uh, the, uh, the, um, the mass, to solve for the mass. How, however, happily, we have a, um, I can find it now. Yep, we have something called Zcalc. In the, it's the very last thing in our resources in Indico. And the way it works, when, when you open it, it, it comes to copy document. The reason is everybody has to use this, or many people have to use this. And so we, uh, we want you to make your own copy in order to do the calculation. When you do that, it's making a copy. And right now, it actually has the, the data in there for the Atlas event that we use as an example. 
So we said the momentum of one was 49.5, and of one mu one was 49.5, the other one was 42.3. The angles were 21 and 227 because we go from the positive x axis. That breaks them down into uh, components and then gives us a net momentum in, in component form, and then the magnitude of the momentum is right here. It also adds these two numbers up to get the net energy, and then squares this number, squares this number, subtracts them, and, and does the square root. And that is actually the mass of our Z boson. So we have that, and if we go to our results spreadsheet again, whoops, that's not the right one. There we are. And go to Z mass. Um, well, I don't, uh, we don't have any, um, any place to put the Atlas event, but if I were saying group three, I would put it right here. Uh, right. So here's how we're going to, uh, let me, and let me just show you where your actual data is. So if we go back to here, so this is event, uh, sort of event, what was we just using these in uh, 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 sequentially? This is event one, this is event two, event three, and event four. Okay. And um, what we'll do is we'll use the same groups again, um, but uh, each group does any two it does well it well that's that's not going to work very well is it so let's say group uh that's split into four groups this time and um the uh each group is going to do uh their group number or their group number minus five. So if you're in group two, you'll do two and you'll do three. If you're in group one, you'll do one and you'll do four. If you're in group three, you will do three and you'll do two. Right, so we have a kind of mixture. Okay, and then- we, we, only have, um, we only have six rooms now, Ken. Oh, six rooms? A, a few, yeah, because a few colleagues left, so. Okay, in that case, why don't we just use the six rooms? That's easier, actually. Um, where was I? Lost my place. Um, there we are. So yeah, so in that case, uh, let's have groups one through four do number one, number two, number three, number four. Uh, and then everybody does the next one after that. And then groups five and six just act as though they're group one and two. If that makes sense. So if you're in breakout room five, you do one, you do, you do one and two. If you're if you're in breakout room six, you do three and four, uh, etc. You know, if you're in group, breakout room four, you do four and one. So you just basically do your your number plus the next one, and that should, hopefully that will mix it up. We'll try. Okay. Uh, actually, these are A, B, C, D. Yeah, so mm -hmm. right. Maybe I'll maybe I'll put this in the chat in a way that everybody can follow. Uh, yeah, that would be good. Yep, yeah, I think so too. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so please, can you resume the general idea another time? Sorry. So we should measure the angle, or yes, you measure the angle. But if you look at If you look at the uh, um, at the CMS events, these lines are all nine degrees apart. So you can see here, this one should be about 10 degrees. And this is of course uh, is 180 degrees. And then we go another 18 and it looks like maybe another five. So that's another 23. So this is two, this is then, um, right. 
203 degrees, for example. So you can use the, these radial lines here to make the measurement of the angle. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. So, so breakout one does A and B. Breakout two does D and C. Breakout three does C and D. Breakout four does D and A. Breakout five does A and B. And breakout six does uh, B and C. There we are. So, and a through through D are sequential. A, B, C, D. How okay. many minutes, Ken? Let's give it uh, five minutes. If, if you only get one done, that's fine. If you get two done, that's great. So basically, though, well, let's make it six minutes. And then um, you, you have to measure the angle using the fact that these are all nine degrees apart. Measure the angle for each one. Then put it into... Uh, just overwrite what I have here for Atlas, and you'll get uh, and you'll get your new numbers, and eventually you'll get the mass of the Z, and then go ahead and you'll put that number into the other spreadsheet. So you take your group your group uh, the event and your group number, and then you put it next to that. So if you're so yeah, so then we'll end up filling out some of these. Okay, so uh, how, how many angle uh, every part have? I'm sorry? How many uh, angle every part have? H how many angles? Oh, so it's nine degrees each radial line. Oh, uh, yes, yes. So let's see, I may have to redo a event A, um, breakout room one, two, three, four, five, ah. So. If you want, I can just have five breakout rooms because actually there are a few people are by themselves. Okay, that's fine, let's do that. Five so breakout I rooms. Will, I will merge six and five, yeah. Okay, that's fine. Right. That will simplify it. Yeah, and, okay, so it's five rooms. And we were, we're either two or, um, or one in a breakout room. Right, and these should be um, right. So. Okay. That fixes that. Okay. Okay. Okay, for me. So, um, are are you are you pretty sure about what to do here? Yes. Yes. Okay. So I tell you, what, I'm going to go and. Well, okay. Don't worry, I'll do it. Yep. So ask me any questions first, and then maybe I'll visit another room just to make sure they're okay too. I don't have any question. I've actually done the first one. I'm sorry. I've done the first one. I don't have any question. Okay. Oh, Nkiate is with us as well. Okay. Hello, Nkiate. Uh, maybe you can unmute. Okay. Oh no, no, don't mute from me. I meant for Nkate to unmute, so he, so he can speak.
Okay, so Funmi, are you able to share? Um, no. I'm sorry, I have no challenges. I'm sorry? Okay, maybe, uh, for me, is it better if I, if I share? Yes, yes, it will be better. I can share from my phone. Oh, okay. So, let me see if I can. So for me, if uh, you can answer any questions that Kate has, and um, I may end up in a different room. We'll see. Okay. Hello, Kate. Okay, so this network is. Ah, oh, I see. Okay. So we're supposed to work on uh, event A, is that correct to start with? Yes. Okay. Then. So let's see if I can, here's event A. I'll go ahead and, and share that so we're both looking at the same thing okay so did you figure out the angles yet yes the first one if each is I, I, I chose 10 degrees because the first this is nine then just one slight change i took one right so the first yeah the first segment is nine degrees so this is a little beyond that so maybe you could say that angle is 10 degrees yes and actually if you look at the second one you can see it's bending a little bit that's because of the magnetic field in cms so you start with its initial direction it seems to be mm -hmm. right on right here so that's mm -hmm. yeah. 18 above 180. that's right one right here 298, right, so. 198. Oh, 198, okay, you're right. Yes. I can't add. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> so, <laughs> so the first one was 10 degrees, and the second one was 198, okay, and what were those uh, energies again? 48 and 43.6? 43.6. Yeah. And there's our mass, 91.5. So um, then we can put that in here. You want to do the honors or should I? I'll do it. Okay. 
Okay. This is um, the forty-two point four. One, two, three, four, five, six. Um, because of the magnetic field, it is on um, nineteen one thirty-eight degrees. Yeah. Sorry. Okay. Let me get the final answer. Okay, so don't forget the negatives in the the negative in the x momentum of the second muon and the y momentum. Okay. Yeah. One, three, three. The negative is where I you got ninety two. Okay. Yeah, I got ninety two is I okay. Ninety one point six. Speak up. The net energy is ninety two. The mass of Z is ninety one point six. Okay, so the first and the second. Oh, you were doing the second one? Yes. Ah. Okay. So what did you get for the second one? 91.6. Um, Kenneth, which spreadsheet we put in the result for the Z maths? You are muted, Kenneth. It's the same one that we've been using? Yeah. Okay. So it's, but it's I the Z it mass the tab. We were a little bit slow with ours because um, on the cell phone it was not so easy for. Right, for I'm sure. First, yeah, yeah. So, Haddad, you get the second mass? Wait, wait. I think uh, no. I am. In, I was in group three. We did uh, group group three. Yeah. 91.1 and then Haddad will add the other one. But you get a very large value of 163.6. I got a very large because value for that number four as well. Yes, the number four, yes. Um, you may want to check your um, your signs because for number four, the uh, both the X and Y 
components of the momentum should be negative. For that is for for D rather for uh, for event D. So let me just put it into my magic formula here. One thirty nine point five. Am I, am I, I'm not sharing, am I? But, but the, the total transverse momentum would still be positive definite, right? Right, right, of course. So, um, 139.5, and it looks like to be about um, 27, so 207 degrees. Right, 139.5 and 227 degrees, right? And then this is 70.1 and... Uh, Ken, wasn't that 207? Because it's 180 plus 27? Oh, did I, did I, did I add that wrong? Yeah, 207. Right. Yeah, yeah, 207, you're right. Um, and then this one is maybe just about three degrees shy of 270. So that would make it 287 and 70.1 and 287. 267. Right. Like I said, I can't add. Yeah, it's coming out of a really funny number. Yeah, but maybe, okay, maybe it's just the tail, because this is the real measurements, right? Yeah. Yeah, that's, yeah, it's, it's probably just the tail. Yeah. I, 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 in working with this, I haven't seen it come out like this before. It usually works out better than this. I'm not sure why. It's, just make sure I'm not making some kind of mistake, although, looking at it, I mean, that looks about right. That looks about right. So, uh, yeah, I'm... yeah. Well, actually, this should be higher. This is. Okay, I guess I guess it's a tail. Yep. So that's the bad news that we have a tail like that. Well, it's not bad news. It's part of it's part of doing uh, doing the arithmetic, part of doing the, the mathematics, uh, and and the fact is that it could be that much off shell. Um, so should we take care of this last experiment, or? Uh... I think I think we're we're pretty much out of time. We're, we've been we've been out of time for a while, so I hate to. I'll just mm -hmm. I'll I'll mention what you can do, and then we can. I'll just take questions after that or or comments. So just for this though, just to look at the, I can sort of force it to look at the. Uh, let's see horizontal axis so let's see let's have it go from zero and so we can see the more clearly what's going on here yeah so um and maybe i can make the bin width smaller well <laughs> that doesn't help a lot Yeah, nothing helps unless I actually yeah, chop it down. Data. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But Just in any case, you know, we're, but it may, it's pretty clear though that our peak is right at about 92. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. Our median says 91.3, which the Z mass, the published Z mass is 91.2 GeV, so that's not too bad, even with our outlier. 
So we're doing okay. All right, and this is normally done, we print this out on paper actually and have students do it with protractors and do the calculations by hand. Um, okay. Uh, so the bonus is um, there's a short Python notebook uh, attached to the Indico page. It's, um, again, we have to find it as usual. Um, there is Colab Notebook. It's the very second thing on the first page. And you can use that. You have to cop, you have to make a copy of it. And then, um, because it's view only, but if you make a copy um, and open it in Google Colab, you can actually sort of do the dice experiment, or at least you can, do something you can do a, a a histogram some histograms of dice and then also uh we can see how we can take that same kind of code very with very minimal change and use it to look at the uh the inside of atlas or cms um to get an idea of of uh, how the how a plot of the angle around of, of particles going in the angle around the beam pipe, angle phi, would look in a plot. And it turns out that if you actually were to do that measurement, it looks a lot like the simulation you make. So, okay. Um, uh, also, you'll find on the Indico page, there are links to the QuarkNet data portfolio and some other resources. I, I included SKA. They have just a few resources now, but I'm hoping we can encourage them to have more. Um, I think that's, that'd be really exciting. Um, and then the rest is basically, uh, we won't take a regular discussion time, but any questions, basically any questions or comments at this point, um, I'm gonna stop, stop the share. And um, I'll stay, for those who need to leave, I get that. And those who want to stick around and talk, I'll I'll stay as I'll stay until Anne or Katevi throws me out. <laughs> Thanks so much, Ken. Thanks very much. Super, really generous. Okay, I'm sure there are questions. Colleagues, unmute yourselves. Uh, Hadad, it's not, yeah. It's not a question, but it. it uh, the way that can explain to us remind me of uh, Walter Lewin, which have a lot of uh, video on YouTube. Say that which again. Which videos? Walter Lewin from MIT. Uh, can you put his name on the chat, just uh, or or a link to one of the YouTubes? That would be great. Yes. Ah, okay. Already. Perfect. Oh, great. Thank you, Adad. Yeah, thank you. Uh, he teach uh, and, uh, at MIT and do a lot of uh, experimental uh, at the Amphi itself. So it's very nice. Great. I'll look for that. Okay, so I think I know somebody had a hand raise at one point. I, was that uh, Kate or I don't remember? Let me see if I can. Hello, everyone. I can see. Hello. Hello? Yeah. Oh, you're on. Mine is just to give thanks for the interesting lecture that you have given today. Uh, look forward to seeing more of uh, those lectures again. Just up. Are you good? Thanks so much. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, Ayuranga, thanks thank for you. connecting. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay. I was putting Walter Blue in my. Maybe something I would just like to share with, with you guys since you connected. There's the um, ISHEP. Um, high Energy Physics Conference has been this week, and they have the, the 
lectures recorded, m many of the lectures recorded and um, uploaded onto YouTube. So I can send, there's a, an iShep channel that you can subscribe to and um, you'll get, you'll be able to listen to some of the presentations, some of which were quite good, I think. I will put it on the chat. the name of the conference again. Oh, yeah. It was the iShift 2020 conference. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And there was also a, um, a relatively small section of the conference on education and on uh, diversity and, and outreach. Those, um, yeah, we, we, had a, we had a couple of talks about master classes and um, they, that was fun. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, by the way, I, 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 uh, I Googled Walter Lewin and clicked videos and a whole bunch of videos come right up. So that's kind of neat. Starting with Death of Stars. <laughs> nice. Already interesting, right? <laughs> yeah, thanks for those links. I, I clicked on the Perimeter Institute one. Um, does it cost anything? You just have to sign up just to, so that they right. have your, your email. Right. I th yeah, I think they they can't. Someone is saying you, you sign up. They ask for your postal, your, your shipping address. Then they say well, we can't ship it to you. You have to download it. So, but that's fine. Uh, okay. So, but Perfect. yeah, but yeah, they, they all. I think everything from Perimeter Institute is free. They have some really nice things. I think they're they've uh, mm. they've done quite a bit. Yeah, especially in these COVID times, I must say, I think this kind of material is just just golden. Yeah, I mean, th this is the the main focus for us right now is is trying to help the teachers in our program to uh, both you know give give them ideas and also pool their ideas to you know teach effectively when you know especially now teachers are saying well we might teach online or we might teach in the classroom or we might be blended I'll I'll, I'll know tomorrow or I'll know I'll know, I'll know next week like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's really interesting. Yeah, I think very stressful for them as well. So if they have yeah resources they can look at or right, so we we yeah. do what we can to help out. But it's interesting though because it's stressful, but at the same time, people are developing capacities they didn't have before. You know, right. I mean, now we we just did a we just finished last night a a course on particle physics for for uh, our teachers online and i don't think we would have had that many joining you know six months ago yeah on course and now they're like yeah sure we can do that and it went very well yeah yeah that's super congratulations yeah yep got one of our fermi lab physicists to give to give the course that was nice too mm -hmm. yeah. okay so i think um Sounds like we're we're the remnant at this point, so maybe we can shall we close it up, man? I think so. Yeah, thank you, and also thanks, Shane, for for joining as well. That was. Uh, oh, thanks for having me. Yeah. yeah, Shane. Yeah, thanks for your help. Always, always a help. I didn't do much, but I did some analysis of data. <laughs> yeah, and, and and you did help me to to add, you know, numbers properly, which is always good. <laughs> thanks, thanks everyone. Keep safe. Oh. Thanks, okay. thanks, Katevi, for also organizing. Yeah. Tootsins. <laughs> Tootsins. Yeah. Bye. Bye bye. <laughs> bye. Thanks, Ray. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. bye.